we are continuing our discussion of treatment planning. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the factors that affect treatment selection. So the first thing to keep in mind is that treatment planning is not one size fits all. Each client is unique and each client's treatment plan should reflect that. The client and therapist must work together to create a roadmap for the client change. And the methods of transportation and the routes taken to the intended destination, meaning the treatment goal, will vary from client to client. So even if two clients have the same treatment goal, the method of getting to that goal could be different from one client to another. So there are a number of factors that will influence your selection of a treatment. Those would be client characteristics, helpful characteristics, and practice and documentation guidelines. So as we mentioned in the last lecture, client characteristics account for about 40% of the change in therapy. Clients are not passive recipients of counseling. So you have to remember that your client is an active part of the therapeutic process. So their characteristics and their involvement will influence their, their treatment outcome. So some client characteristics to keep in mind when selecting your treatment would be, first of all, their psychopathology. So what is their, their level of symptom severity? Their socio-demographic descriptors, so things like their gender, their age, personality traits, things like sociability and coping style, race and ethnic membership, and their motivation or readiness for change. So those factors can really be distilled down to three things. Client impairment, so their level of symptomatology and their level of disability as a result of their symptoms. Their symptom management, how do they express their symptoms um, and how do they, uh, what is their reaction to therapy? So what is their level of resistance or reactance? And then number three, their social support. What is their social support system like? And so we also need to keep in mind the helper characteristics that will influence your selection of an intervention. So as we've stated over and over this semester, the person of the therapist is a critical factor in the success of therapy. But helpful characteristics like age, sex, professional degree, and years of practice account for a very minimal amount of client improvement. So this suggests that you know, a client or a therapist with a doctoral degree is no more effective than a therapist with a master's degree, and that even years of practice experience um, don't really, that doesn't really um, have a major influence on client improvement. So APA has outlined eight components of clinical expertise. These include things like the therapist assessment, diagnostic judgment, uh, systematic case formula formulation and treatment planning. So their ability to assess, diagnose, and formulate treatment plans, the therapist's clinical decision-making and treatment implementation and monitoring of client progress, their interpersonal expertise, so their, their ability to form those therapeutic relationships, continual self-reflection and acquisition of skills. So constantly honing your skills, reflecting on your, your performance and, and trying to improve that. Appropriate evaluation and use of research evidence. So are you incorporating research into your selection of, of interventions? Understanding the influence of individual and cultural differences in treatment. Seeking available resources. So things like consultation, adjunctive services. So maybe working with you know, speech therapist or psychiatrist or somebody else who could help your client work with their goals. And then also having a cogent rationale for clinical strategies. So are you able to articulate and explain why you make certain clinical decisions? So these are all things that contribute to clinical expertise. But all these eight components can be distilled down to four basic things that the helper has to have the ability to do. Number one, they have to be flexible and receptive to feedback. So certainly there are certain parameters for effectively implementing interventions, but within that you have some flexibility. So you wanna make sure that you really are fine tuning the intervention for the particular client. And then you have to be receptive to, fe receptive to feedback. So feedback from the client, as well as feedback from sources like um, colleagues you may consult with or supervisors. The helper also has the ability 
must have the ability to continually expand and enhance their clinical skills. So, you know, once you finish your degree, once you're practicing, you will still always have to acquire new skills and fine tune the skills that you already have. You have to be able to articulate comprehensible clinical recommendations. So again, you have to be able to justify why you're recommending certain interventions for your client. You have to be able to um, have an understanding based on research, based on your theoretical orientation, and be able to explain why the selection of this intervention is justified. And then you have to be deliberate about incorporating personal and cultural client characteristics throughout the helping process. So that's not to say that, oh, because my client is a member of this particular culture, I'll have to select this intervention and implement it this way. No, the idea is you have to take into consideration the influence of your client's culture on that particular client. And based on that influence, you choose interventions that are most appropriate for that. So it's still not black and white apply you know, this intervention to this group. It's just about taking into consideration the influence of their culture. And you're not only looking, looking at cultural characteristics, you're looking at your client's personal characteristics. So their coping style, their personality, their likes and dislikes will also influence your choice of intervention. And as we've mentioned, helpers are expected to select interventions that are, that are empirically supported. So the choice of intervention should be supported by research. Practice guidelines help clinicians tailor treatments to specific clients with certain conditions. So based on specifics of the client, that may that be their age, their gender, their preferences, you can select interventions for that client with certain conditions. So based on their diagnosis and their symptoms, as well as their personal characteristics, those will come together to help you select the appropriate treatment. Guidelines are recommendations for treatment structure, process, and strategies. So they're not prescriptive, they're not mandating what you must do, but they give you guidelines for the structure, process, and strategies that you use. And at the time that our book was published, APA had developed 17 professional practice guidelines. So you're always welcome to go to the APA website and check out those, those guidelines. <laughs>